So I'm Jessica Costantino. I'm the advocacy director for ARP. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. How have you enjoyed the morning so far? Yeah, what an incredible bunch of speakers. Well, you're in, in for a treat because we have two more today. Um, you can read their full bios at the QR code, but I'm going to start by introducing you to Maggie Gunderson. She is a expert in age and dementia friendly care. She worked for 20 years in a healthcare marketing setting and then transitioned and has been doing um, 10 years in the senior healthcare industry with a focus on how we can make our communities dementia friendly. And so you will hear from her and then also you are going to hear from Brendan who is the co-executive director for Walk Massachusetts. Some of you may have remembered the name as Walk Boston. I think a lot of us still have that locked in our brain. But anyway, um, he has been doing this work for more than a decade, a founding member of the city of Boston's Vision Zero Task Force. And just because we knew he was coming today, we put it at his alma mater, Holy Cross. So <laughs> here we are, I'm Hold gonna, and he wore his purple shirt, right. So um, I'm gonna turn it over first to Maggie, leave some time for questions if you have any from her presentation. Hear from Brendan and then we will take questions on all topics. So plenty of time for questions. Sound good? Excellent. Maggie, take it away. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. I'm a little bit, here we go. Can everybody hear me? Good. Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping first, right? I get very nervous when I present. So what ends up happening is I start to talk really, really, really fast. And sometimes when that happens, like my mind gets ahead of my lips. Okay, I'm on the next slide over here in my mind and back here, I'm still forming the words, you know, that are three slides back. So Robert, if I start to do that, mix up my words, go a little too fast, I just want a little bit from you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and the other thing too, just as a show of hands, how many of you, like this is your first time out of the gate approaching the dementia friendly community campaign or intending to start a campaign? Okay, there's a few of you. How many of you have been doing this for a while? Okay, all right, so I'm gonna try and gear my presentation that way. But having said that, I do need you to know that the first few slides actually kind of, I'm gonna sort of gloss over them quickly this was um, one of the campaigns that I did for the town of Franklin. And uh, I present it just so that you can have some of my, my thinking behind you. There'll be moments later in the slides where I'm gonna talk about something and it'll be good to know where this is going. Um, so here, I just wanna share this with you. This, I believe, is Kapidium, which is a community in Norway. So this is actually a gated community, is adventure-friendly community. Um, it's so it's, it's one owned by one entity. So it's kind of like in our neighborhoods, we have like the benchmark, which is the building, you know, and it has skilled nursing, assisted living, independent living in the one building owned by benchmark. This is like 23 acres that is owned by an entity and it is a community and people live independently. And everyone who works there, whether they're the cashier at the grocery store or they're the barista at the coffee shop, um, they're all paid by the entity. So the senior can still go out in the community and pretend that they're buying things, purchasing things, living their normal daily lives, but it's all within a community that is fully understood, embraces, and understands dementia. Um, and so I find this quite interesting. Big, large sidewalks. Of course, this fence is actually a chair rail, you know, if you stop and think about it. Benches that are small enough for just two people and not five, and things like this. A lot of thought that goes into this. So I thought I'd just share that with you. Hopefully that's where we're going um, one day soon. <coughs> so I, I wanna start with asking you, before you begin your dementia-friendly campaign, start with the end in mind, all right? So um, where do you wanna end up? Now, when I did my first dementia-friendly campaign, it was a lot of work. And in the end, I kind of sat back and went, ooh, you know, like, what did I accomplish? You know, what, what can I, what's my feather in the cap? So before you start, be thinking ahead of time, um, like, what do I want to look like at the end? What do I want to achieve? So it's just a small suggestion. And to do that, ask yourself these questions. Firstly, why are you doing this? Did your town manager say he wants to be noted as a dementia-friendly community? 
Are you doing it because it's a professional goal of yours before you retire? You want to say you've done this? Um, where are you going to get your money? What's your staffing and your resources going to be when you start this and when you finish it? And what's your timeline? Is this just a one year thing, two years or three years? And do you have the money and the resources to sustain it? All right, so just some questions. So from some of you, level of success will be very, very different depending on what you're, why you're doing this. For some, you just might want an awareness campaign, which in my mind is a dementia-friendly awareness campaign, educating the population um, about what dementia is. Some of you might have the goal of getting into the, the school system, which is difficult to do. That's a separate conversation for later. I've got some ideas about that. Um, they have modules, like five-year pods that they work with. So it's hard to get into the school system, into their nurse, into their health department to have a dementia program on a regular basis. It's hard to do. Maybe you just want the support of your town. Maybe you want to start working with public health and your EMS system. Um, DPW, so you can work on signage. And maybe eventually housing, so you can work on reconstruction. And I put them in that order, like one, two, three, because if you want to go that way, that's the easiest way to go. Um, I forgot to mention here rec department, because that's helpful. You can't hear me, right? Is that, okay, thank you. So, yeah. Thanks. You're um, so did I miss anything? Do I have to go back? Robert, do I have to go back? Come on. Okay. Um, so I mentioned like... I listened fast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I put them in the order one, two, three, because this is what I found is easiest to work with. Your public health and your EMS are going to want to work with you because they're in the trenches. They're out there. They see it and they want to work with you. Um, DPW might be willing to work with you if you have a good relationship with them. And then later, I know you asked us to t speak to a question like, what is going to define our success? Like, what if we wanted to be participants in the community, if you want to have a, uh, I forget what your question was to us. Um, what would, it, what would it look like for you to be successful in this? And my suggestion is that you have to be out in your communities. You cannot be sitting in your senior center at the end of some street that nobody knows you're there and nobody knows what you do. So what that means is you go to your department head meetings, you go to your town meetings, you go to Founders Day on the Saturday where you have a table and you put out your brochures. You have to have a presence in your community because no one's going to want to listen to you. No one knows who you are. For the longest time, senior centers have basically been around for around 20 or so years. Many senior center directors are now retiring because after 20 years you can get your pension. There's a lot of turnover right now. They've been funded for about 20 years, but no one's really paid attention to senior centers. It's just kind of been like, oh, we have to have one. And it's never, you know, you're not the focal point of the department head meetings. You're not important to the town meetings. But if you have a presence in the community and you can work with the community members, to get them excited about what you're doing, then town management will start to listen to you. So um, that's DPW and housing, that's a different animal altogether. Um, but if you've established your credibility and you've got your town management on board and when the funding starts to come in and they start to make changes, then maybe you're able to work with housing. Because um, my, my understanding, and I've worked with three municipalities, housing is not funded well, there is not enough handicap housing and accessibility is not good. I had a town of close to 40,000 people in our housing community, there were four handicap apartments, which is just not acceptable, right? So we have to get in there and make changes. And um, as we talked about earlier, in our efforts to make towns dementia friendly and age friendly, we're gonna benefit this disabled community as well. Um, but we'll, housing, we'll get to housing later. Um, so. So in my mind, if you've, it, at the bare minimum, when you're creating a dementia-friendly community, this is what I think are the four key components. I think every community should have a memory cafe. I think every community should have a caregiver support group. I think every community should have a social day program. And I think every community should be aware of respite programs. So I'm gonna to speak to Alyssa a little bit. The respite programs, mostly you can work with your ASAP, 
they have respite programs and they have the funding for respite programs, but your outreach worker or social worker in your town needs to know about those programs. On, um, on memory cafes, um, they are fabulous. Uh, and there's a lot that you can do with them. It doesn't necessarily take a lot of money. Some memory cafes are at senior centers. Some are at libraries. Some are at a little cafe down the street. You just have to get it started. And eventually the money will follow. All right, so you can go out and you can try and get grants. You can work with your friends group. You can work with local uh, retailers who will sponsor next month's event. And you don't need much money to do a memory cafe. So um, let me just take a step back here because I see a little bit of some furrowed brows. Um, a memory cafe for where, where I did it, a memory cafe is a once a month event where people with dementia and their caregivers come together and they do an activity um, or they could be entertained. So for me, when I did my first one, I had a grant. And so I could use my grant money to buy entertainment. So we didn't mean for it to become a show, but every month there was a show, which was our memory cafe. And the nice thing about a memory cafe, in my mind, a memory cafe is a judgment-free zone. So what that means is everybody who's in the room knows what dementia looks like. And everyone who's in the room is accepting of those types of behaviors. So in my memory cafe, oftentimes, Harold. your loved one starts to get dementia, they become embarrassing. And you can't take them places. And you can't leave them in the car. So your world as a caregiver is very, very small. And the pressure, the, the stress from that is very big. So if you have one place where you can go at least once a month to, um, to be with other people in the same experience and have some fun, it's a great stress reliever. And in fact, when I did one of my memory cafes years ago, we had what we called these groupies. They were memory cafe groupies. And they would go from one town to the next town every day of the week just to have that hour. And they were the ones giving me the advice, like, oh, you got to go with Harold. He's a great, or you got to go with um, this particular entertainment. They're great. Or go with that, this guy. He's a great magician. And so they were a great set. And they had their own little um, contact Facebook page. They would keep in touch with each other. So that's what they needed for their community. So um, memory cafes are a great resource. I'm just going to make sure I keep up with my slides here. Um, so um, on the social day program, that will be a lot more work. Okay, You're going to have to petition to get a staff member who can maybe run that for you, or you'll have to find a grant where you could pay to maybe have staff people run your social day program for you. So. Um, of course, every, uh, for those of you that don't know, a social day program is um, daycare for people with mild to moderate dementia. Oftentimes, it can take place at a senior center um, if you've got the funding to staff the position or a grant to staff it or um, uh, not necessarily volunteers because there's a high level of responsibility with that. But when you start a social day program, you are adding value to your community like you would not believe. To be able to have a place, a safe place, where your person with dementia can go for the day and the caregiver can either go to work or can go get things done and know that they're in a safe environment where there are activities to keep them cognitively guessing and going and doing things, entertainment, exercises. Um, that's probably gonna be the best contribution you can make to your community. So um, let me just see one more thing here. All right, and so just so that you will sense from me, in my opinion, a dementia-friendly community is a community that's aware and educated and informed. An age-friendly community, that's all the infrastructure that Patty and Ruth talked about earlier. Um, but it's important for you to realize that's how I'm going to speak to these slides. Okay, so when I created my dementia-friendly community campaign, these were my components. I had a steering committee that helped me, and we'll speak to that in a moment. 
we do, as a group, we developed a mission statement, and this will be important to you because for those of you that live in small towns, there will be townspeople who will come up to you and they will say, oh my, I'm, I'm, I think we should do this, and I think we should do that, and why didn't you do this? And did you know, my Aunt Susie knows so and so and so. And you can avoid all that by saying, thank you so much, what a great idea, I am gonna take note of that. But this year, we, do, we have developed a mission statement and we have guidelines that we're working to achieve, but I think your idea is fabulous and we will keep it in mind for next year. So that's one of your, you know, cover your ass kind of moments, the mission statement. It also keeps you focused, because when stuff starts coming at you and you're figuring, you're sitting thinking, oh, am I doing this right? You know, and, well, should we do this or should we do that? Just like any corporation does, you go back to your mission statement and to, so you stay on track and you don't get slighted. You do it a year later. Um, Yearly goals, and again, one, two, or three years. Um, try and get grant money for that, it's out there. And that's taking place in the conference room next door. However, I have learned everything's being recorded, so after you learn how to do your campaign, if you wanna watch the slides later with Rebecca Gallo and Patty Sell, they'll show you how to fund it. And there's the Community Compact and there's some other funding sources out there. Um, so in my mind, program components should be a point person one person who you're gonna say is your point person on this campaign. Um, of course, a budget, that's gonna be paying for your memory cafe, paying for your collateral material, your signage. Um, your education awareness campaign, I use Dementia Friends. Uh, again, there's those key components at the bottom. Okay, so now when you create your Dementia Friendly campaign, when you create it as it evolves and to sustain it, you're gonna need a village to help you to do this and that speaks to our topic here today. So um, what I did, this is my steering committee. So for me, this does two things for me. Strategically, it includes everybody in the town and I get consensus and buy-in. Okay, so everyone's on board, everybody's a part of this effort and they feel value added, okay? But on a more tangible, structural, daily basis, this is my audience group number one. This is my first audience. So I'll speak to that in a moment. Um, on my committee, I, of course, had someone from my Council on Aging, someone from my friends group, someone from town management. I would be ideal if you could have the town manager. Um, and the library, definitely align yourself with your library. They were a saving grace for me. They were wonderful. Um, one of the things that they did is in their lobby, they just dedicated their whole front lobby to books on dementia and Alzheimer's. So they really became a partner with me. So I'm out around town talking all about dementia and Alzheimer's, and their front lobby is wall-to-wall -wall books for every age group, which was wonderful. And they also became my first audience because that, these are the first places I went when I did my presentation. And because they are part of my buy-in, part of my steering committee, someone in each of these groups eventually became a Dementia Friends champion. So for those of you that don't know, that we'll speak to that later, there's the Dementia Friends, um, Anybody not know Dementia Friends, the champion, that whole thing? We're good? Okay. See me later and I will explain that to you. Um, public safety, of course, is always on board because they're out there, they see it. They're usually calling the senior center or to calling the town to say we've got someone hoarding, we've got someone who's got some sensitive issues going on. Definitely school committee because when the time comes and you want to get into the school system, you have an advocate. Um, the food pantry, they are also out in the field and they see these people first. Um, because not everyone has a family member to take care of them. There are so many seniors with dementia living alone and no one knows that they have behavioral problems until they go to the store or until they go to the food pantry or until someone drops off food from the food pantry. Um, now in my town, we had what was called the Interfaith Council. So this was easy for me. Some of you who don't have that might have a little more work. This council was created by all of the faith groups in my town. So the Methodist Church, the Congregational Church, the synagogue, the mosque, the Catholic Church, they all got together once a month and, and spoke about issues. So they were already formed. It was easy for me to go and meet with them to talk to them about my efforts to create a dementia-friendly town. <laughs> The other thing that's important to know, and, and this might be old news, when a caregiver is struggling with someone at home with dementia, they are more likely to go to their pastor or their faith leader than they are to go to a family member, and clearly not to a senior center or to a police officer or someone of authority. 
So it's important to make sure that your faith members, your, the leaders of your faith community, know you're creating this campaign, make sure they're on board, make sure they, they know the behaviors. <gasps> I knew that was going to happen. I was talking too fast. So I'm trying to, there we go. Um, Chamber of Commerce, that was part two for me. In my town, we had a downtown partnership, and that was my year two. I was going to move into the business community, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. Transportation, again, that's another group that sees it first. They might see someone who um, is acting odd on the bus, or someone who is always on the bus alone, or someone who's having incontinent issues on the bus. So it's good to have a relationship with them and to have a, a lot of communication. Have them on your team so that they're coming back to you and telling you what they see. Um, your cultural council, because they might be the people to pay for the entertainment at your memory cafe. Um, the other thing we had was um, in my group was a caregiver who was dealing with someone from, with dementia. I would say add a few more if you can because it's their voices that matter. They're the people we're trying to help. So definitely make them part of your effort. Um, and in the town, maybe somebody from housing, somebody from DPW, rec department, people with deal with others. Of course, the ASAP is um, the regionally funded groups that help seniors. For those of you that don't know what an ASAP is, see me later, um, and I can tell you a little bit about that. They will help you find resources for your respite program, for your transportation program, Meals on Wheels, a lot of other, also financial support. Because if you want your person with dementia living independently, They'll need those services. And there are so many that we're seeing now that don't have family members or don't even have a neighbor who's seeing the behavior and, and advocating for them or come calling the senior center or calling the town saying, oh, my neighbor this or my neighbor that. Some of them are all alone and they have the condition and they don't know it. So if you can get in with your ASAP and provide Meals on Wheels, the financial representative to help them pay their bills um, and keep their heat up, turn their air conditioning down, meeting with them on a regular basis, helping them find transportation. Um, the ASAPs are important. And also, this is something I brought in. My town found this unique. And Robert, you might like this fact. The other people I brought on board were my local VNAs because the nurses are out in the community. Um, and sometimes someone who um, just had a hip or a knee replacement, that's secondary to the dementia that they've been dealing with for years. So it's good to have them on board, have a conversation going with them on a monthly basis where they're keeping track of things. Um, and I brought them in uh, because in, in two of my three towns, I have established what I call a CIT program, which is a community intervention team. Um, and I did that separate from this. Um, and for those of you that want to talk about that later, we'll get into it. But a CIT team is a group of people in town who touch on people who might have issues. And we come together once a month. And that's when I found my visiting nurses association and a social worker from my physicians group gave me more information than I knew. So that group in particular is a great group to have a relationship with. So again, structurally, you know, um, on the surface, strategically, this is great. But also on a day-to-day -day basis, I went to the library, I trained their staff. That was, these were my first audiences. I went to the pantry, I trained their staff on dementia friends. and. If it, Eventually, they became champions, and when you talk about having tentacles out into the field, this is how you work. Um, now, my first year, I chose to do civic groups because they're easy. They always want a guest speaker. They will never turn you away. I mean, you're going to the lines. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, so it's, it's easy to get into that. Um, and then one group that I didn't list here, and I wish I did, was um, boys clubs and girls clubs. 4-H clubs, because it's going to be hard to penetrate the school system, so you have to kind of do a go around and start to get um, meet them where they live. You know, go out to the daisies and those small groups and do your presentations there. And not only present to the kids, but make sure the parents are in the, in the room as well and they hear your presentation. Um, so I call this a 9 to 5, it's, uh, that it's not just a 9 to 5. And this is where I'm different from the rest of the pack. I did a lot of my work on nights and on weekends. So forgive me, I'm going to be crass here for just a minute. For those of you that are lazy senior center workers who do your 9 to 5 at that building and you go home, this is not for you. You will not have a successful campaign. I started my presentation by saying, you know, you have to have a presence in community. You've got to be there. They have to see you at the Founders Day Fair. They have to see you, you know, if the school has like a science fair. 
have a presence in the community so you're approachable. People know who you are. So you're going to have to go nights to the Lions Club. You're going to have to go on your Sundays to the church um, and to the synagogues. Um, so these were the easy ones. Um, and every time I presented here, one of the things that I would do at the beginning of my presentation is I would ask by show of hands, could anyone tell me if you personally or you know someone that's struggling with dementia? Um, and so then I could tailor my presentation. And when there were occasions when I could make it a little more personal, I would. So there was one presentation I gave at Continue Education. And that was just five or six people. So I, I sat among them, and I catered the whole presentation to them, like, oh, well, Jane, what did you find? Or Robert, how difficult was that for you? And it made it more personal, and definitely those people were on board. And at the end of that presentation, not only a lot of questions, but people wanting um, to find out how they can get involved. Um, for the bigger groups, of course, it was a gloss over kind of presentation just to touch on things but it's important to start the presentation by showing letting people know by a show of hands how prevalent it is how many people are struggling with dementia somewhere in their lives all right so let me just see we would also do presentations the one we did was dementia friends is everybody familiar with that? Beth Schultzberg, Dementia Friends? And earlier when we talked about memory cafes, if you become a dementia friend or a champion, you can have access inside her, inside of her portal where you can get a lot of information. She has a listing of all the entertainers you could possibly want to provide entertainment at your memory cafe. So it's a, a great organization with a lot of sharing. Um, so the steering committee, these are some of the things that we did. We reviewed our campaign on a pretty regular basis. We only get together once or twice a month because I didn't want to be a burden to them. Um, we reviewed our campaign. We identified weaknesses. We expanded. We set our goals. And like I said before, for me, it was civic groups first, then the businesses, and then eventually the schools. Um, I started to get to the youth, again, I said, with boys clubs, girls clubs, 4-H groups, that kind of thing. But I also went to the private schools first. Because the public schools are so structured, as, as I mentioned earlier, you will find that the private schools, whether it's a charter school or a Catholic school or another entity, even, even a stay-at-home mom's group that has pulled themselves together, they have more flexibility in their schedule, their curriculum. So they'll be more likely to bring you in. And what was interesting is the school that brought me in, um, I think I did a first grade. And of course, everybody got a button. And then out on the playground that day, it was like, <gasps> Where'd you get the button? Where'd you get the button? Everyone, every kid wanted to be trained. And it was, it was just wonderful. And I brought the books from the library, one of which is something crazy like My Grandmother Wears Her Underpants on Her Head or one of those crazy books. So I brought that and we shared it. And it was um, a good moment for them. And we talked a little bit about like, how much time do you spend with your grandparents? And what do you think of, you know, do you notice changes in their behavior? And if you did, how would you handle that? That was all, you know, working with the teacher for sure um, so that she handled those things. Um, but then after that, repeat, repeat, repeat. Because if you're going to put this much work into it, um, make sure that you have a program that's sustainable. And the end of all of this, like I said, my first slide, um, make sure you end up where you want to end up after putting in this much work. So my last slide here is, again, another community. This one is, of course, in the Netherlands. And again, it's another gated community. In this particular one, you do see an apartment type complex, but there are individual duplex houses. Every house has a little picket white fence out in front. And they can roam this whole community freely, um, go for walks with their strollers, sit down at the fountain. There's a little cafe that they can go to. And like I said before, all the staff who run the cafes or run the retail stores are staff members. And there really is no um, exchange of money. They, people get to purchase things. It's all included in their, in their living costs. Um, but it's a, it's a great place to be. The fountains are beautiful, and family members love to go there. So that's my presentation. All right. Yeah. Yep. Looks like a great place to live. I'm signing up now. Um, um, any burning questions for Maggie? Yes. Is there any overlap between the autism community and the dementia-friendly community? You know, when 
So for the purposes of the recording, the question is, is there any overlap between the communities that are people with autism and people with dementia? And if you could use that. Um, so yeah, we, you know, if you stop and think about it, yeah, right? All of us here, is, first time you ever heard that question, you're just thinking, yeah, th th there are so many opportunities for overlap. The one area where I had a difficult time was trying to get to the purple table and do a presentation amongst that group, or maybe even just to get listed, but there's a financial component to that, which is discouraging. Um, but one group that they did work closely with was my um, disability commission in my town, and they had, um, they worked in tandem with me quite a bit, and they of course met monthly as, as my crew did. Um, my town, they had created um, a little booklet for um, handicap accessible restaurants, which is something similar to like a purple table thing. But in particular, it was good for which, ones, which, which restaurants had a ramp, which restaurants had soundproof walls for people who had hearing aid problems, which restaurants had good lighting and that kind of thing. So someone with dementia or a caregiver might want to have that same booklet. And that's something I think a lot of towns could do, a call upon their disability commission to spend time in their restaurants, at their recreation departments, at their banks, and just put it on paper, who has a ramp, who doesn't have a ramp. And there's a level of accountability for that that I, I think every town should have. Yes. The, the question is, is how, how Maggie got connected and invested in all this work and also who's taking it on after. So take it away. Um, so yeah, it usually ends up at the senior center. Um, and when it comes to sustaining it, there are a couple of things a couple of different towns are doing that I kind of like. They're sharing the responsibility with the Department of Public Health. Um, so if the burden gets to be too much because sometimes senior centers aren't funded well enough or they can't sustain it inevitably, it becomes a thread that runs through the Department of Public Health. So. Thank you. All right. There'll be more time for questions. Oh, Linda, you have a question? any person-centered programming into the approach. So I'm gonna ask you to rephrase so I really understand what you mean by person-centered. So what, what I have found in, in my experience um, is that um, I've had some significant outcomes um, when I, um, like if a, an example um, is uh, um, this person was very aggressive in a nursing home. This wasn't my, um, my deal in that this was a, another expert in the field. And um, they found out that he had been a farmer. So what he does in the nursing home he's associated um, is that every day he puts um, the eggs out and then he picks them off. And it, it, it changed his whole um, aggressiveness. He stopped doing it. And I'm just wondering if you've had successes in that area because each person has, they have a, a background and it reaches their heart. That's really good. I, I personally haven't because I've typically like run campaigns, um, but I can see how that would be valuable. Um, and it's interesting, he would probably have to be in a community where they witnessed that and where they were able to address it, right? The, Right. Yeah. So could you? Could you do that in your memory cafe? Yeah. Because he doesn't necessarily want to stay in the old McDonald's, you know, he, because he was on another level. Right. Um, but, but you could see him with, um, missing the keys. Yeah. I, I just feel like we sometimes need to get to that dark space. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah.
All right, if everyone would thank Maggie. More time for questions coming up after we hear from Brendan. But I think the through line in both of these presentations is that one person can change things. And you just heard Maggie's story, and while she talked about all the people she brought in, she was one person who did this. And taking that and translating that into your community so that you can make a change in a way that's meaningful to your community. Back to the idea of the people you are with, the people who live there, the people that care most about this. So we're going to now hear from Brendan, and he's going to give a different presentation, though we want you to keep thinking in the frame of how you can use some of the tips and tools to help at your very local community level. So, Brendan. people issues is definitely definitely the right thing so uh well thank you all for having me uh brennan carney co-executive director of walk massachusetts um let's make sure we know how to do this wrong way okay uh walk massachusetts formerly it was founded as walk boston in 1990 uh we find each other one dollar if we say walk boston at this point instead of walk massachusetts um because earlier this year we renamed uh to walk massachusetts after going through a strategic planning process with our board staff many of our partners across the state um, to really reflect the work that we're doing statewide. Uh, I've been with the organization about 10 years now, uh, just took over as co-executive director in August uh, with my colleague Althea Wong Acorn. We're a small but mighty team of five. It was great to hear MPHA say they only have seven people. I was stunned that they only have seven people with the amount of work they do. Um, you know, we're, we're a small team. We also have a great board. We're all looking for more people who want to get involved in board or committees. So. Um, Stay tuned here and see how you might want to plug in. Um, but part of the strategic plan, you know, we really talked about our mission and our vision. Uh, you know, this mission remains constant. Like this is the stuff we've been working on over since 1990. You know, making walking safer and easier in Massachusetts to encourage better health, cleaner environment, more vibrant communities. Um, I realized as I was putting this slideshow together that I wore the same exact shirt <laughs> in that photo when I went to GBH. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I have to wear the purple shirt to be at Holy Cross, so it's OK. Um, but you know, as part of the mission, like we also were like, well, let's, let's put out a vision there, too. You know, it should be a message where people walking, you know, no matter race, identity, age, ability, lived experience, feel safe, connected, and valued on our streets and sidewalks. Uh, that photo at the bottom, that's from one of our walk audits in Springfield earlier this year as part of the Mass in Motion program. I was really jealous of their banner. They actually did a really nice job with that. Um, you know, and, and as part of this, you know, there are three main values that really hang together there, and it's community, equity, and partnerships. Um, these are all... mobility devices, um, you know, and we also prioritize working in places that have had disinvestment. So, um, you know, while we do do a lot of work in the greater Boston area, where a lot of it is happening in neighborhoods like Mattapan, like Grove Hall, places that have really uh, been un under underutilized for a long time. Um, and then partnerships. We never work alone. We have five staff. We can't work alone. <laughs> Um, you know, we work with community partners, nonprofits, other organizations, um, and also a lot of the times we work with the state. We work very closely with Department of Public Health and MassDOT on uh, many different issues. Um, we took three main goals coming out of this. I'm not going to read everything on these slides, but I'll just say the, what the three goals are. But, you know, advocating for safe and inclusive, enjoyable places for people to walk. These are not groundbreaking things. We're, we just tried to actually make the steps to, to how we get to more walkable places. Click, click, click. 
we want to work in places where people walking have the greatest needs. A lot of that is working in environmental justice areas. Um, if you don't know what environmental justice is, that's fine. The state didn't actually define it until this past legislative session. Um, but now there is a definition for what environmental justice means here in Massachusetts. It really is based on uh, around race, income, and language. So language, it's if uh, at least 25% of the community is non-English speaking or non-English proficient. Um, race, it's I believe more than 25% uh, non-white. And income, it's, uh, it has to do with annual median income. Um, I can share with you the full definition from the Executive uh, Office of uh, Environmental Affairs, if you'd like. Um, and then goal three, like how do we actually get built environment change that is noticeable, replicable, and impactful? I think this is a big thing for everyone that's working in public health, everyone that's working in transportation is, oh, we got a grant to work on this project, but it's actually about changing the streets. <laughs> like that's, you're not gonna show that in one year. Like how can we stay engaged and you know move, move that rock up the hill to get these changes made um, and then be able to go back to that community and get those after photos. Like how do, how do we then tell that story about how you actually got the change made? So I, I kind of put the cart before the horse here, but you know, I think I really need to take a step back and say, what do we mean by walkability? And it, uh, you know, it's not just the ability to walk. It is, you know, more than that. Um, it, you know, going back to our goals, it's, you know, that inclusive definition that accounts for lived experience of all people. Um, and it's also about creating environments that make the decision to walk easier, safer, and more inviting. I know myself, like, I live in Framingham, and when destinations are too far, I can't walk. But also, even if it's close, if there's one really terrible intersection, I'm not gonna do that. So like, how do we make these fixes and make it safer for people to be like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna meet my friend at the coffee shop because it's just down the street and it's beautiful to walk down the street. It's not a harrowing experience. And you know, walkability, uh, can look very different in different communities. Someone was saying we have 351 cities and towns here in Massachusetts. Walkability means different things in different places. Um, you know, in an urban, suburban, or rural setting, it can look very different. Uh, I skipped ahead already, but you saw, like we found you know, where the sidewalk ends, if any Shell Silverstein <laughs> friends here. Um, you know, this was a walk audit in Goshen. Um, I saw this and I was like, I need to run over here and take this photo, because. <laughs> This is our error page on our website, too, um, which uh, just very dorky if you've ever uh, <laughs> wanted to do that. That is our organization. So, um, you know, walkability is also important for so many different reasons. Um, I'm not going to get into it because I don't think I need to make the case to any of you on the importance of health, environment, economic development, and community. But there are also, I'm not pointing the right pointer. Uh, we, we kind of think about five different things that walkability includes. Um, we try to bucket it into these different things, you know, thinking about making connections. Uh, are there actual destinations that people can walk to? Um, safety, which can mean different things for different people. Uh, I know I'm a white male over six feet tall. Like, I might feel comfortable walking in certain areas when other people don't, uh, especially at night. Um, then comfort, you know, is it just nice to walk down the street and activity are are there places that you know uh that look like people want to be and you want to be there because there are, there are more people there so i'm just going to click over those real quick um you know the connections i love this photo at the bottom right people walk here there is no sidewalk um it's very obvious that is the desire line you know that is a goat path that is created there um, you know, are paths and crosswalk where they need to be? Destinations, a variety of places. That picture at the top, uh, the picture at the bottom is definitely Salem. It probably looks a little spookier than that one today. Um, but yeah, like are, are there places that, you know, a variety of different destinations, uh, also like 
is it a place that shuts down at five o'clock because everyone goes home or are there people that live there too and so there are restaurants and grocery stores big one is safety that we work on um you know is it uh is it safe to cross the street are there uh, are there way too many lanes of fast-moving traffic and you just don't feel comfortable going there? Uh, comfort. You should be able to walk year-round. Uh, you know, the picture at the top, um, that was someone who contacted us in the South End a couple years ago in Boston. Um, and she said, I basically am locked in my house after a big snowstorm because my building shovels the sidewalks, but... I could just loop around my building. That's it, because every curb cut is absolutely closed over. Um, so you know, we worked with the city, and they, they are work moving in a direction of making their contractors when they are clearing the streets. They're also clearing their curb cuts. But you know, thinking about that comfort, making sure it's available for people to get around year round. Lastly, you know, activity. Like, are people out on the street? Um, people might have read Jane Jacobs back in the day of like, you know, are there eyes on the street? So more people around, you feel more comfortable. Uh, so crowd question, um, what here uh, makes a place more inviting? Like what, what things do you see in this photo that might make it a place where people want to be? Benches, great place to sit. Anyone else? Shade, yeah, some nice street trees. They're people, yeah. People of all ages, kind of a, a nice range of ages there. Um, yeah. One thing I always notice in this one is there's trash, which is <laughs> kind of not good, but it's a place that's lived in, right? Like th this is a, a place where there's a ton of people out. So, um, but you know, all our communities don't look like that all over the place. You know, a lot more of them look like what we're dealing with here on the left or on the right. Um, wh what do we see in, in these photos? Anyone? No sidewalks. Speeding vehicles, yeah. Um, yeah, the picture on the left, actually there is a senior center behind her, behind the person taking the photo, and there is an independence living uh, just beyond that light ahead. So definitely those, you know, those pain points, those little pieces where these important connections Anyone else before I move on? Safety. Safety, yeah. yeah. Um, one, of, one of our best investments is one of these handheld speed sectors, I will say. Makes for great photos. And also makes the case of people drive way too fast here. We need to do something. Um, so I'm going to give you the data case for, for walk audits. Um, and then I will define what a walk audit is. Um, just making sure I'm not going over my time. Every year, uh, Walk Massachusetts uh, releases every year, I can say that now because we've done it two years in a row. Um, <laughs> we uh, release a pedestrian crash report looking at fatal pedestrian crashes from the year before using MassDOT data. MassDOT makes data available on their impact crash portal. Don't ask me what impact stands for, they made it stand for something. Um, you know, it, we look at that information but then we also look at where those crashes were happening. You know, what is the speed limit of that road? How many lanes does that road have? Are there sidewalks on that street? Um, and you know, what we found last year, uh, there were 101 pedestrians across the state that were hit and killed. That was over 23% of the total of all traffic crashes. Um, that's bad. That's very bad. Um, but you know, what are, where were they happening? We talked about the definition of environmental justice earlier. 71% of those crashes happened in environmental justice census block groups. Here were those more of a definition. You know, the AMI is less than 65% of the statewide average, 40, per, 40 plus percent were in minor, minority districts, and 25% lack English language proficiency. And then there's also another category, which is like a combination of all of the above, just lesser percentages. Um, yeah, we were like, you know what, we should, all these crashes happened, wh where are they happening? They have released this new definition, let's overlay these things. Um, and you know, th that kind of points back to the disinvestment that has happened in many of our environmental justice communities across the state. 
Um, and it's just showing that, yeah, this is a problem, and we need to do something about it. Um, so we had a call to action on our report. We said, MassDOT, you need to actually put out an action plan on pedestrian safety. They have a draft it's being circulated right now, which we're very excited about. Um, but this is not just on MassDOT. It's kind of on all of us, and what are we doing to push our cities and towns? Because once again, 351 cities and towns, a million little fiefdoms, what, what are we doing to make things safer on the streets there? Um, you know, we should be asking our mayors and elected officials what they're doing to create safer streets for older adults and everyone in cities and towns. Because we actually looked, sliced the data another way. We looked at percentage of folks that were over age 65. 38% of the fatal pedestrian crashes were over 65. 50, 65% were over age 50, because I know AARP, AARP uses 50 and older. So 65% of the fatal crashes were over age 50. So when you see things in the media about distracted teenagers walking around on their cell phone and stuff like that, that's not who is getting hit and killed on our roadways. That is a great media sound bit, but like that's, that doesn't actually reflect the data. Um, so we look at walk audits as one way to show, help show bring along those elected folks and bring along those decision makers, that action is needed. So a walk audit, it's an organizing tool. And we really think it's a way to uh, help locals make connections out on the street and bring people out to show the actual issues that people are dealing with day in, day out. Um, you make the case for build environment change rather than this is not a full inventory of every sidewalk out there and say, oh, this square needs to be replaced. The next one's OK. Then the next one's a little rocky. No. We're, we're thinking higher level here. We're saying it's tough for the kids to get to school because there's no crosswalk by the bus stop. What can we do to fix that? There's no benches by the senior center. People want to be able to go for a walk, and they need somewhere to sit down on the way. Um, you know, we've, we've done a bunch of walk audits across the state just this summer, uh, including multiple sites in Worcester and Springfield. That was one of the hottest days of the summer taken there. We had like one of the uh, little thermometer, handheld thermometers. That parking lot uh, in the sun, it got up to like 115 on the, the black. Shade trees were great because it was only 90 in the shade. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's walk audits are a wonderful tool. but. Uh, you know, a big thing here is it can be a way for people to help share their challenges and bring along the decision makers to experience the problems. This was actually a walk audit done with the Age Friendly Group in Boston um, under the Age Strong Commission. Um, and we, we actually met at a senior center and we walked up Blue Hill Ave and they shared the problems with, you know, the sidewalks that are all brick, they all heave. Like, that's a huge problem for tripping hazards. Um, we looked at the signal timing at some of the lights, and it just didn't make sense. You couldn't get halfway across the street before you already had a don't walk. Um, but you know, it's, it's great, great opportunity. I loved what Maggie said earlier about being out in community. I think walk audits definitely hit on that. Get people out on the street from behind a desk or a steering wheel if that's all how they experience the community. Like, it's a problem. Got to get them out there. Um, the next slide, I apologize in advance for the amount of text that is on it. These are some basic steps to leading a walk audit. You got to plan. You, you got to really have it honed down. You know, what is your focus? Are you thinking about that back to Springfield where Maggie was, uh, where she was walking down the street, the safe route between the neighborhood and the senior center? Are you trying to find places to add benches? You also want to start with data. Um, you know, the crash data can help inform your route, but you also kind of got to talk to folks because maybe you know a really dangerous intersection that you think is dangerous, but there's no crashes there. Maybe everyone completely avoids that intersection and finds another much longer way around because it's so dangerous. You want to invite people along, the different stakeholders, get different voices out there. Um, you want to get the word out if you are hosting a walk audit. Make sure it's easy to find date, time, and location. I don't know how many times I've gotten in a flyer about a, someone was really excited about something, and I'm like, 
but when is it? <laughs> like, wh where am I going to meet you? Like, don't just send me to a website. Give, give me that information too. Um, and the big thing is, like, if you are hosting a walk audit, like, on a night or a weekend or during the day, like, people might not be able to participate, but they really want to tell you about problems that they've seen. So, like, is there a way to them get in touch with you? Um, big thing, you, you want to record your observations out there. Um, I like assigning tasks to participants, so everyone is not like just jotting notes down about the same exact thing and then everyone forgets to take a photo of the group. Um, ARP has a great walk audit toolkit, which is in English and Spanish, um, that can help keep you organized. Um, and then the last thing is like writing up a brief memo so there's something tangible to refer back to at the end um, is super helpful uh, so you can then follow up with decision makers. Sorry, I'm just checking my time. Great. Uh, I think the big thing is there, because there was so much text on that slide, um, is that um, you, you don't need to be an expert. I think that's the big thing here. I am a history major. <laughs> like, I do not have initials after my name. Um, it, you know, your lived experience and observations are important. Uh, a walkout is really about in identifying those pain points in our communities and coming up with suggestions how to fix them. Also, if you hand out clipboards to people, they all feel much more important. I, lo I love this photo. Like, you know, people like will take notes if they have a clipboard in their hand. Um, you know, and, and then like, we, we thought about a lot of other ways to present walk audits during the pandemic because all of a sudden that main organizing tool was gone. Like we could not do that. Um, nothing replaces getting out on the street with a group, um, but we did want to kind of demystify that process a little bit, make it less intimidating for someone to lead on their own. Um, so I, I think Karen's here. Yeah, Karen from uh, UMass Worcester Prevention Research Center. Um, reached out to us, she's like, ah, we actually have some funding that we need to spend down, um, and do you want to partner on this? So we actually came up with uh, some short videos that actually took each of those steps that I, the full wall of text that was on the screen before, it was a, vi a short video for each of those. Each of them were, you know, between a minute and a half and three minutes long, just like nice bite-sized pizzas. Um, and we actually led it in a bit of a cohort model where it's flipped classroom style. So like we put together some groups here in Worcester as a pilot, um, and instead of me presenting at them, people watched the videos, and then when we actually got together, it was responding and like asking questions, and people you know, gave us the address of the place they were gonna look at, and we brought it up on you know, Google Street View, and everyone in the, you know, in the group gave some feedback and different things that they were observing. Um, you know, it, it was, I think it was a lot of fun, first off, um, but also, like, it really expanded our capacity. So, like, there were all of a sudden five walk audits that were happening in the span of a time where our staff would usually do one. So, like, this really, you know, is kind of expanding the reach. Um, we're actually doing this right now in Springfield thanks to a community change grant from AARP. So we're really excited. Um, so if you want to bring a cohort to your community in the future, get in touch. Um, I, I think this is, these are my favorite things. Like, you, we really all need to be better storytellers, I think. Um, th this first before and after, like, yeah, that's kind of wonky. It likes is telling, like, you know, it, if you remove parking from the street, it makes it safer to cross the street. But you can also just set up a photo. Like, <laughs> that really tells the story of, like, the person trying to cross the street and trying to see if a car is coming. Um, it's the same thing just much more impactful. Like, how do we think about these big issues and tell stories through, through photos? Uh, on the left here, this is what my phone, like, roll looks like after a walk audit. Um, not many people in those photos, but it's important, too, to, you know, tell the story. But the photo on the right really tells the story. We're trying to cross the street here. Um, and, you know, that is, uh, uh, yeah, it's Deb and, yeah, it's a bunch of folks. That is her walker named Myrtle. Um, she and Myrtle actually never cross at this intersection by themselves because there's not enough time to get across the street. 
They actually wait for the shuttle bus, which takes her a quarter mile down the street. But then she's stuck at the senior center until the shuttle bus comes back. If we fix this intersection, her independence goes way up. So, you know, thinking about those small little connections where walkability can be improved. Um, I, I love this photo because, like, this is super meta, too, because it's a photo of a photo. But, like, you know, how, how you can also paint the vision of an area that's not something beautiful right now. So, like, this was along the Charles River. They're talking about this big Alston I-90 multimodal interchange project. Um, we, we were like, okay, that's, that's big and massive. How do, we, how do we have people engage with this? A vision of separated paths along the Charles River. How do we make it safer for people to walk and use it as a park and not just have it be a bike superhighway? But like understanding that that transportation piece is important too, but like let's if we're improving this area, let's let's improve it for everyone. Um, so you know we got people to write why they want to fix this area and then we followed up with with the uh, decision makers about that. Um, th this was a fun one. This actually was a uh, a protest uh, in Grove Hall in Boston about this crosswalk. And uh, the city of Boston was involved with this because this was like the age strong, age friendly thing. And the city was super nervous about this because they were like, we're technically protesting ourselves. <laughs> like, um, but this was fantastic. You know, it engaged a ton of people. This was, uh, there's a crosswalk right in front of the senior center and library. and people did not yield at this crosswalk. Like, and it, the street was slightly too wide, so even if a vehicle did yield, people would drive around them. So, you know, th this really called attention to this was an issue. And, you know, they made changes. The, you know, they made it a little bit of a raised crossing. They bumped out the sidewalk so you couldn't actually get around it. But I think the bigger thing is they changed this parking, the one parking spot out front. It had been one handicapped parking space they realized that the MBTA ride van actually was blocking the crosswalk every time they came to pick people up or drop them off. So they made it a 15 minute parking spot. So now the ride van like made it possible so so many more people could get to the senior center safely and people could still cross the street. So protest gets the goods. Um, you know, if your goal is to have more benches on your walk audit, benches are fantastic and they are so great for photo ops. <laughs> So um, I, I don't think it was this one, but another one. We got an email from a guy from Public Works who was installing the benches, and he was like, I, I'm trying to install a bench in Oak Square right now, and someone is sitting on the bench before we have bolted it to the ground. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was just showing that, like, there's not enough places to sit. Come on, how, how do we get more places to sit? Uh, th this might, though, be my favorite. This is uh, Sam Balto. This is in Roxbury. Uh, <laughs> On, on Walnut Ave, and um, that is Tom Brady's face on top of that sign. Um, so many people were, Sam would like drag in this sign, it didn't have Tom Brady on at the time, uh, before and after school because he was, the sign kept getting knocked over, and he was super concerned. So he and I had done a little bit of a walk audit around, and one of the recommendations here, he's like, how do, we, how do we make it better? I was like, let's like put Tom Brady's face on top of it, jokingly. And he was like, okay, how do we do that? I was like, uh, okay, if we're gonna do that, let me contact a guy at the Boston Globe. So we contacted a guy at the Boston Globe and we did it before school one day. Um, and it was a hit. Um, you know, and Tom, Sam and I like worked on some quotes beforehand. So yeah, this is Boston and Tom Brady is a champion and a leader. And when Tom Brady is getting sacked, Bill Belichick makes sure he changes the plays and improves safety for him, said Balto. <laughs> who has worked at the school for three years. If the Pats make moves for safety for Brady not to get sacked, I hope this can improve the safety of our students crossing the street. <laughs> Before the Brady heads appeared, Balta said drivers were so intentive they would strike the crosswalk posts that were recently placed in the street near the school, knocking them over and leaving them mangled in the road. His thought was that if people saw the New England icon on top of the signs, they'd be more careful. Balta launched the experiment on Walnut Ave with the help of Brandon Carney, spokesman for Walk Boston, an advocacy group that works to make streets safer for pedestrians around the city. People really fly down Walnut Ave or use it as a cut through. That's not right on any neighborhood street, let alone one with so many kids walking down it. I'm glad Sam is taking this step. He's looking at a way to call attention to the crosswalk. If Tom Brady can make that happen, it's great. So um, this like went, this was like five years ago. It went super viral and um, it caught the attention of the city. They actually made changes to this. And uh, also their 
they got a grant for the Safe Routes to School grant, so they're actually doing like full-scale construction. This is like a temporary condition. They're redoing, they're gonna be a bunch of raised crosswalks, not just at this crosswalk. Um, so I will leave you with these ideas um, if you haven't already gotten any. Um, brainstorm where you'd lead a walk audit and who do you want to take part and start planning to lead your own walk audit in 2024. Um, identify a location for a new bench or shade tree in your community. As we've seen, benches are super important. As you saw from that one photo in Springfield, it can be very hot if there is no shade. Um, if you don't know how your community takes requests like through 311, we actually have a report a problem page on our website where we try to consolidate all those different ways that people report things. Um, the nice thing about using a system like that is they give you a tracking number and then you can follow up with a local elected official and put them on the case, making sure things happen. Um, you should really find out if there's a pedestrian bicycle or trail committee or a group, like a friends group in your municipality and see how they can help advance like shared priorities. Like you, you guys might both be working on the same thing just with a different lens. Um, so sick those volunteers on, on your efforts. Um, you know, write a letter to the editor for your local news outlet or Streets Blog Mass. Streets Blog Mass is a transportation advocacy website. Um, definitely check them out. I am on the board of that organization, so like I am pitching that as well. Um, but then lastly, you know, check out example age-friendly policy actions and age-friendly infrastructure improvements on our age-friendly page. If you go to walkboston.org slash friendly, you can find those or just search for it on our website. Uh, and then I would invite you to participate in one of our Walk Massachusetts Network monthly Zoom meetings. Uh, it's on the third Wednesdays of the month at 1 p.m. We also record them. Uh, we don't record the Q&A because we feel that people should feel free to ask any question and not feel embarrassed or that it's going to live forever on the internet. Um, yeah, we try to have different topics or different speakers come and join us. Uh, sometimes I actually use it as a working session and I will show people an early version of one of our reports and get feedback. That's actually how the environmental justice piece got into our crash report last year. Good feedback from the group. Uh, and lastly, we have a Beat the Bay State virtual challenge taking place throughout the month of November. Um, we'd encourage you to create a team and join us. So thanks a lot. Yes. Uh, you, this is so interesting. I know nothing about your organization. Do you sort of serve as a request for full credit for walk audit? So, like, I work in suburb around Cambridge. It's one of those communities where, like, if you want to be able to organize, could you, could you let me know? And is there, like, a calendar? Or if we wanted to participate in, in a walk audit that another group is doing in one of our communities? I, I will say a blanket yes statement. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like, if, if you guys, like, do a walk audit and like you put together a report and stuff like that, we're happy to like put a blog post up on our website for you um, if that's helpful. Um, we have found that in Springfield, they were doing a bunch of walk audits on their own and they were like, we have no repository and we wanna like consolidate them all. We're like, yeah. just send them our way and we can write a blog post mm -hmm. up for you or something like that, so yeah, yes. That's a good question. I will say there are some like state mechanisms that like have more intense walk audits. There's something called a road safety audit from MassDOT. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is like a walk audit on absolute performance enhancing drugs because mm -hmm. um, they are looking at all the problems along the way, but it's really driven by um, being one of the like top 200 crash locations uh, or crash clusters based on pedestrian or bike crashes especially. Um, but I, I think the if, if a community is ready for a walk audit, I think it's kind of up to the community. Be like, I, I think this is something that I would love to like tackle or like ha I really think having that like local champion is like the big piece. Um, because like when we did the cohort model for the walk audit academy, here in Worcester. Karen is also a Worcester resident, so Karen was really like our local champion who was like, 
let's identify these different groups and ask other people, like, I know you're not interested, but who are three people I should talk to who might be interested? So I, I think having that is kind of useful. Yes, Karen. So I'm just going to repeat that for the video. So um, that, you know, it, it's not always about the documenting the pieces, but it's also about making those connections within the community. And, you know, uh, Karen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's also like making those connections, helping make those connections within the framework of the city or town. Like sometimes departments work in silos and they never talk to each other. And so like sometimes bringing people together on a walk audit or like kind of doing it from the ground up or from the outside is helpful to be the person making those introductions and invites instead of being like, oh, this person in that department would have to uh, actually ask their boss to ask the other person's boss if they were allowed to think about coming in on a date in the future. So like sometimes it's useful to for us to like be an outside organization or for someone to be a community member or within a different department to kind of be that convener. So, yes. Yeah, so the question is, how do you deal with people who are reluctant to change the culture or, or maybe historic fabric? Would, would that be fair to say? Yeah. Um, I think some places like that get sued <laughs> um, is, is part of the answer. Um, like they, you know, the city of Boston was sued for not uh, quickly transitioning fully over to a fully accessible city. And they came to a consent decree this past year where they actually have to be replacing, uh, I, thi I think it's over 1,600, but I, I actually heard the other day that it's 1,630, which is the year the city of Boston was founded. Is like that, that is the number of curb ramps that they have to replace every year. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think in Beacon Hill, they also came to an agreement about the type of material that would be used on the tactile warning pads on the curb ramps. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's important that we make it safe and accessible for everyone. If people feel they need to walk on the street because it's not safe for them to walk on a sidewalk, like we need to be rethinking our streets then if we need to slow our streets down for people to walk safely too. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you can uh, either go to, there is a community page. We are redesigning our website. So right now there is a community page for every community in Massachusetts. That was a nightmare. Um, but so you can see if there are uh, walk audits that were in that community. You can also search for your community or search for the word walk audit on our uh, website. And we, we try to do a blog post every time a walk audit happens and upload the report there. So thanks for asking. Um, I just want to say thank you to Maggie and Brendan. Um, I am always amazed at the amount of talent that we have in Massachusetts and how generous people are with sharing their experience and their expertise. And we are so honored to have both of you here today. Um, as you think about the one thing you can do in your community and as you think about how you might make a change, Seeing success is something that makes people want to be engaged with you. 
and what you heard both from Maggie and Brendan were tiny bites of success that led to big successes. And that's the type of work that we hope that you take back with you so that there can be engaged community members. Every picture that they showed practically had people in their community. And that's where we live and that's where we want to be as we age and everybody is aging. And so think this through, but use them as a resource, use AARP as a resource. And thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate it.